Hello, welcome to Sonic Talk, episode number 452, broadcasting today, Wednesday, the 22nd of June. That's just before Glastonbury, in the middle of the Euros, and I think Wimbledon starts next week. So uh, lots of distractions here. Uh, This is the podcast. It's not about sport or weather. It's about uh, music production, electronic music, playing live, anything to do with the business of creating music, the technology behind creating music, that kind of thing. So uh, uh, please do subscribe to our YouTube channel if that's the sort of thing that interests you, if you're first here. Uh, Of course, we stream the show every Wednesday at 4 p.m. You can find it either at sonicstate.com forward slash live or it goes directly to our YouTube live uh, stream, which is uh, YouTube slash sonicstate slash live. Want to say thank you very much to our show sponsors. Uh, that's Isotope. Uh, we've got a competition coming up later on. Uh, last week we asked you to tweet some hashtags, and if it was you, you may well have won the Isotope vocal synth. Uh, if not, um, you might have another chance this week. That happens about halfway through the show. So do stay tuned. Let's get to our guests. Uh, we'll start with Mr. Rich Hilton, who is not in his usual uh, studio in. Um, in oh. He's not there. He's he's lost his. He's, we've lost his video. I'll I tell you what. I'll go to Dave Spears instead. While Rich, because Rich is actually uh, on tour and he's in the UK at the moment because he's with Chic playing. Dave Spears, however, is not. Dave is uh, in uh, in close up in his uh, synth cave, uh, right in the south of England, somewhere not too far away. How are you, Dave? I'm, I think I'm all right. That's I don't know. It could go either way. It could you could witness a middle aged man having a heart attack on this show? Oh no! Uh, only because Chris and I decided a, f- a couple of weeks ago or a few months ago that actually what we're going to do we we're going to get together once a week and go for a walk because we live in a beautiful part of the country and we we're going to go for a walk. So uh, and we would talk about business on this walk and we did one a couple of weeks ago. That was really nice, you know, loads of little country lanes. We ended up at a pub, which, as far as I'm concerned, is a really good move. Uh, although we didn't drink because it was during the day, but that was a nice thing. Anyway, today we went out, and I reckon we must have covered about... We, we kind of got lost. Ah. We ended up miles and miles from anywhere, and then we kind of had to do the same loop again in order to get home. So, uh, yeah, I'm... Knackered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I could... I know he's watching this, so I could either fall asleep or... Probably have coronary. So well, I, I am. Me. I am very glad to hear that uh, you are doing. Uh, you're, you're taking care of of business and taking care of business in both respects. That's great. I can see Rich is back with us now, so let's go to him quickly. Of course, uh, Dave Spears from G4 Software. I forgot to mention G4 Software dot com, makers of fine software instruments. And here is Mr. Rich Hilton, who is uh, in a hotel somewhere in a secret destination in London, where he's been flown in specifically to play disco music to the people of the UK. How are you, Rich? <laughs> I'm okay, but I can't hear you guys, so I don't think this is going to work. Ah, you can't hear us as in, uh, let me just try one thing uh, quickly. Uh, hold tight. Uh, you can watch me uh, bending down over the uh, back of the uh, the computer and see if I've uh, if there's a connection that's gone. One second. Okay. Whoa. That was good. What was that? It was a thing. He pressed the thing. He was plugging something in. Seems to be all okay this end. Can you hear anything, Rich, or can you just hear nothing at all? That's a really difficult... I I see a little bit and I hear a little bit, but it's really, it's coming and going. So uh, I may hit a point where if I just don't understand what's going on, I log off. Okay, well, that's fair enough. Uh, Anyway, uh, Rich, pleased to have you here. I'll try and speak clearly. As if you were a foreigner, <laughs> and it wasn't your first language. So, uh, Rich, you're here for a gig, right? Yeah, I'm here for three gigs. Tell us about them. <laughs> Pardon? Uh, tell us about them. <laughs> Can't hear you. Oh, man, that's so disappointing. Uh, I'm just trying to think if there's any other way we can do this. I don't think I've got any other... I tried just... shutting off video, and it didn't help. No, okay. Let's do it through the medium of dance. Yeah, maybe we could do it as uh, mime. Yeah, I don't think that's going to work out. Well, I don't know whether Rich is going to... Maybe Rich will, will stay on air and we might come back to him if uh, if it improves. So I'm sorry to hear that, Rich. Um, I'll go to Mark for the time being. Mark Tinley. Hello. 
Hello, I Mark. Hear me now. I can, oh, but your video oh, seems to have frozen. Oh, there you go. You're back now. Uh, Mark, you're actually in your new shop, which uh, is looking I'm in very. My new shop, yeah. How is everything going? It's really exciting. I've sold some things. I might even be able to pay the rent this month. So there you go. So it's all sort of slowly moving in the right direction. Excellent. So, Mark, I think at this point, because you're on the iPad, you have to give us a tour of the store, right? Uh, okay. Can I do a tour of the store? Uh, uh, so I ought to go on the other camera, would not I? Yeah. How do I do that? <laughs> there you go. Ah, wow! It looks like it's a proper guitars. music. It's like a proper music shop. Very strange guitars. This is a guitar. It's made. This that was on my wall last week or a couple of weeks ago. It's yeah, like a canjo. Some conventional electric guitars. Uh, some locally made electric guitars. Another canjo, and some weird flowery kind of thing, and a. Uh, Oh, what happens if I... No, don't do that. <laughs> so I've got some guitars. Yeah, a lot of guitars. And then I've got uh, my brother's box set. Woohoo! Selling uh, the family heirlooms. Look at this, look at this. Look, who wants to buy this? This is very rare. It's with a certificate of authenticity, and it's Miss Tara Bush. Oh, is it a tummy, one, the Tummy yeah. Touch box set? Yeah, look, it's got uh, little synthesizers and things. It's very cool. I'm sort of an an art, noise art gallery as well as a shop, though. So some of these things are sort of on display, and most of it is for sale if you give me loads of money. <laughs> More conventional things. A uh, really old valve amp with a Triumph preamp in it. Uh, what else can I show you? Oh, should we go outside? Yeah, show, show, us the, very show, quick show. show us your frontage. Free notice board for musicians. Uh, the Dead String Garden. So if you're a busker and you've lost a string, you can come and pick one up from one that someone's discarded when they changed them. And more Dead String Garden. And this is my frontage. Oh, nice. So that's my shop window. This is a bass guitar, uh, fretless bass made from reclaimed wood by a local guy. Um, I've got some vintage analog crap. And uh, some microphones and resonator guitar made out of a gas can, which I made. And this is a pink children's garden spade, which is a single string dilly bow, which I made. Um, and then some stuff in the window. What about this? Get that microphone. I made that microphone guaranteed to be farty. <laughs> Mark, that looks awesome. Oh. I, I'm looking forward and, uh, to it. And some more. I'm doing like loads of circuit bends, and I've been selling circuit bends, and people are coming in and going, what does this do? And making very loud screeching and squealing noises up and down this very... Look, this is my muse. Wow. And this is my sign. This will, this will take you in the direction of my shop. I like that. And in we go. Excellent. I like and it. I've even got a counter and everything. Look at that. A man behind the shop. <laughs> yeah. And That's those awesome. are nice as well. This is a local guy's been making like these guitar hangers for me, which are in the shape of the guitar that you want to hang on the wall. So all very nice, actually. I'm glad to hear it, Mark. That sounds brilliant. Cool. So, and, and, and within a month, I've had enough. You know, people are starting to come in and uh, I can pay the rent this month, which is something. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I'm really glad to hear that. Um, I guess this might be a good time to uh, move on to some uh, some topics. Let's start. Let's start with something. This this looks kind of fun. This was actually uh, this popped up in Fact Mag, and it's a, a, a man arrested for having 80 speakers in his van. I know it's illegal, but it's the weekend. There's nothing really anything about this apart <laughs> from it's one of those things. Is why. It just did it, and uh, the man was in, arrested in Queens, New York, after during a Mets game. Uh, he went. His van features eighty speakers. It's got twenty grand's worth of it, uh, equipment. He explained, which put to full use at ten forty three p.m. on the intersection of one hundred twenty seventh and thirty fifth Avenue. Uh, the police approached him and they arrested him. He's saying, I know it's illegal, but it's the weekend, he said. And he was charged with second-degree criminal nuisance, a general noise person, and disorderly conduct. He said, I usually get a ticket or I get thrown out or I pay a little fee. And this raises two interesting questions. Now, the first one, I was curious. Um, when was the last time the neighbours complained about your noise-making, Dave? 
a man with ple- I know you moved recently, well, relatively recently. So now you've got and, and your your fa- your immediate uh, family doesn't count because obviously they're in the same building. Have you had anybody say I don't suppose you could you keep those dreadful synthesizer noises down or anywhere else for that matter? I'm looking for just kind of any tales with amusement or anything in it would be fine. No. Uh no. Where I so this is the first detached house that I've owned. Prior to that, as you know, we lived, kind of lived in a townhouse. And all my neighbours in that row were musical. Some more irritatingly musical than others. I probably was one of the more irritating ones. So I was definitely annoying synth neighbour because I was working from the garage and whatnot. But my next door neighbour uh, on one side was this kind of mad Rachmaninoff piano pianist lady in fact the, the husband was a kind of blues guitarist which isn't my favorite type of guitar music at all and uh but they were they were pleasant enough uh, what, and what used to kind of rile me that was more about them really is that because it was a three-story townhouse the kind of uh, the living room was in the basement the the stairwell as it were acted like this kind of massive acoustic chamber so whenever they played their piano in the downstairs living room it resonated through the whole of the house and of course if I was in bed I would hear that and that actually got quite entertaining because I'd be watching TV like really late at night and I'd turn it down she'd be playing this kind of it sounded like Keystone Cops music to me (laughs) and I'd be watching some kind of drama you know kind of real emotional drama and then you get the wrong soundtrack yeah yeah and that kind of made life a bit of music uh and i and i put a blog post up about it i said i really like the close that i live in because it was full of people of different nationalities and everyone was supremely cool and the only thing i love uh, that drove me a little bit nuts about it was the fact that my piano uh, my neighbor was this kind of wannabe concert pianist who would just you know, play at three in the morning or whatever. Uh, and it turned out that they read my blog. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, nothing directly for years. Uh, I had the only really slightly amusing story. My folks lived in a really beautiful, big old house in the middle of nowhere when I was... I kind of moved to London and then I went back home again for a while. And uh, my band used to rehearse in a part of it and it was this fantastic old building. And... Uh, we could make as much racket as we wanted because we were, you know, it's kind of middle of nowhere, middle of the country, and that was brilliant. But they, there came a time where they were going to sell it, and they said, uh, "You might have to keep the noise down a little bit tonight because uh, we've got this person. In fact, we've got this person coming, and we think he's from the music industry. His, uh, his surname's Idol. Of course, we thought, oh, Billy Idol, that'll be it." So we <laughs> cobble together a rendition of Rebel Yell that we're going to annoy him with when he comes round to have a look at the house. And uh, we see the door open and we launch into it. And this face, actually two faces, the first face pokes his head round the door and it wasn't, it was Eric Idle. A Monty Python. Yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> Closely followed by George Harrison, of course, who just went, keep the noise Whoa. down, lads. <laughs> Excellent. Well, that's a pretty good... I, I like that. That's a pretty good interruption. You should have uh, spun on a dime and played um, Always Look on the Bright Side of Life, really, by... Uh, I, I, I yeah, hate to say it, but there was an element of that as they walked off. <laughs> I should probably exactly. should do that. The YouTube police will probably have us. <laughs> it seems we have Rich Hilton back now. Uh, I, I don't know if you can hear us okay, Rich. You, you chuckled, so yeah, I'm guessing... actually, it actually seems to be good now. I've... I've Brilliant. done everything I can by shutting everything off, and it seems to be working. Excellent. Well, I did a sign for you. What's I can't see that, Dave. I'm sorry. It's oh, all washed out so twice. Tell us about your gigs, Rich, it says. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, there's a festival that Niles put on or curated or whatever the current fashionable word is for it um, at a place called Fulham Palace. Uh, called Fold Festival, F-O-L-D, which stands for Freak Out, Let's Dance, which are two of the moments yeah. where it show obviously. And um, it's a three-day festival that's going on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, featuring a bunch of artists, including us, and we will be playing with some of those artists, and we will also be doing the usual chic thing. Interestingly, this takes place simultaneous with not only Glastonbury, 
but also a Prince Tribute Festival that's going on that's being curated, I believe, by Mark Ronson and has a bunch of very uh, impressive sort of guests involved. So I'm going to be curious to see how this thing works out. But uh, we're hoping for the best. Excellent. We well, played I- last night Cork, Ireland. Ah, okay. How was that? I'm sure that was good. They love a the dance. Okay. Those people, uh, Irish people love this music. It's unbelievable. And the audience in Cork last night was so kind. It was amazing and pretty big. Excellent. I'm glad to hear that. I mean, that does. Uh, that, so uh, the, 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 the topic that we were talking about was the neighbors issue, which I'm um, obviously, you know, you're yes. working in, a, in your own, you know, in a studio facility, which presumably is not in completely, uh, uh, but, you know, it must be in a neighborhood of some kind. But maybe you have another tale. Uh, it could also be you complaining about the noise because you can't hear your mix kind of story. <laughs> no, when, when we first moved to Newtown, Connecticut, you know, my kids were young and they were they were rehearsing bands quite a bit. And at one point, they I think decided to either rehearse in the garage or out in the driveway. I don't recall. And because we didn't know the current local etiquette, we got some complaints and the police came by. And I was I wasn't there for this, but uh, there was a conversation and they had to stop. But subsequently, it was discovered that if we were to issue notices, like when we were going to have a party or something to let them know that there would be noise, that it would calm the neighbors and it would make it less likely for that to occur. So since about 15 years now, I don't think we've seen any police officers investigating the reason for a noise complaint at our house. But the last time it was, it was due to my kids rehearsing a rock band somewhere, you know, audibly obvious and people not necessarily appreciating it. On the roof. As far as my own work... Um, I were at Niles house. The studio is in a converted third floor bedroom and I've never had any, but I don't don't really listen that loud when I'm working. Right. So I don't really tend to inspire that kind of response. Hmm. Okay. I mean, I guess it's probably to do with in our game. It's more like the the repetition of the same pattern or you know the uh, the, because obviously you have to go around things around and around around things all the time don't you so i get that can get a bit irritating sure well you're playing when you work on something you're listening to that thing like all day long usually or maybe one or two things but um (laughs) yeah if you just just don't crank it up that loud so that the neighbors are complaining it just and i'm quite comfortable not cranking it up that loud for very long that well that's fair enough that's fair enough. I, 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 I was just trying to remember that the only time we've ever had a complaint here was when I was reviewing the Dreadbox Erebus. <clears throat> and I have to confess, when I put, we, we just did Cymru Beats at the weekend, and I was, the, the room was a kind of big uh, rectangle, and the speakers were in the corner, and there was uh, like Mackie things on a pole with a sub on the bottom, and I was down one of the walls. I didn't really notice it. When I started playing, and when I turned the Erebus on, all I could hear was really, 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 really loud bass and nothing else whatsoever. And it was really curious because I, I thought it was, you know, the sound system, but it wasn't. It was just the position of the place. So that, but uh, uh, that's the only time I've ever had a call saying, what's that thing making all that bass? And, and I can confer. And everybody else goes, wow, that does sound pretty bassy. So that's the only time it's ever happened here. Mark, have you had any complaints while people have been trying stuff out in your shop? I had one earlier today. <laughs> Awesome. I could I could give you a list actually. I've I've got a uh, a unisex hairdresser opposite me, and her clientele are probably seventy years old and older. Um, <laughs> and I put some I put uh, that uh, Oliver Heldens track on that I like, which has got that Becky Hill girl singing on it, and I put it on really loud to test the PA. <laughs> and she came out and she went, "Oh, that was loud! It made me jump!" So. I guess that's a complaint. This is um, this is interesting. Glastonbury has two festivals. So while the festival is going on in Pilton, which is miles away, there's an actual fringe festival going on in the town. And they've got like a little stage. Glastonbury FM have a stage down in the market square. And uh, they've had loads of complaints. They've got a license to play live music down there. And they're getting complaints left, right, and centre from people, which I think is just off, really, because it's they, and their their noise limit down there is eighty four decibels. Wow! They're not allowed to go over eighty four. 
That's not loud. And I said, to, I said to the guy that's running it, you've got to be kidding, because I reckon that bus going past behind us is more than 84 decibels. So, um, so I, I, people do get really antsy about it, and the people you least expect as well. Um, my my 70 year old um, people who are having their hair done opposite are sort of, sort of really pretty okay and very tolerant of me actually, and uh, the lady who does the hair in there also very tolerant. Um, they're amused more than anything else by the the kind of noises that come out of here because they don't sound musical, I suppose. Um, but it's like young people, you know, people half my age are complaining <laughs> about some dance music that was being played down wrong, in the market. It's the wrong genre. For half an hour, you know, <laughs> for what for one week this thing's on and it was for half an hour and they're like, they called the police. Wow. Unbelievable. It's bad. Uh, okay, right. Well, the other thing that's that's to do with this topic is, you know, as we, we might have seen, there, there, there seems to be a culture of uh, people who can cram as much wattage and base into a vehicle as possible and i found this video this guy called uh, steve mead designs uh and let me see i think it might be this one so here it is saturday morning this is um, raining for two weeks straight this is steve mead one of the video and his videos get millions of views i mean not not primarily because they often involve scantily clad ladies with their hair floating about all over the place from the base but this one is uh is, is a vehicle he's got I, I mean it's obviously fairly so i mean he must turbocharge these things so here, here he is. This is his uh, giant... Uh, it's got four 18-inch subwoofers in it. Uh, I'm just trying to find what happens. So here's the space. He's going to turn it on. And in this, in this video, he's going to demonstrate uh, it uh, shredding a phone book. Right, check this out. This is mighty convenient. So, and I just thought, well, what... Yeah, in what world do you go, yeah, I need one of them. But watch this. Here it comes. Oh. Go on. <laughs> There's more. <laughs> now. I suspect if one lived in the vicinity of this gentleman's workplace, one might have a thing or two to say about about that sort of thing. But it just seems like such... I mean, there's tons of these videos out there of people, you know, filming stuff on their phone and people's reactions to them. And and, and it, it just it, look, a, it just looks really dangerous. It's like being inside a massive subway, especially if you're listening to it in the car, where it's blowing your hair, like um, if you had any, not, not like me, of course. And it just seems kind of totally, totally bonkers as to how that could possibly be the case and I, I just i just don't get that kind of whole thing I, i'm sure we've looked at this stuff before i mean there's there's always lads you know in our area who kind of zooming around with you know a bit of extreme sound system in but nothing as mental as that. that's crazy yeah they're always in like voxel novas and stuff like really small cars with big bass bins god it's come on since my day i think about the most luxurious i had as a kid you know as a teenager we figured, we suddenly realised that you could take like hi-fi speakers from your house and put them on the back seat of your car and at least you'd have a decent bass response as opposed to those sort of terminally crappy things that were about, you know, six inch. But they were basically tweeters in the, in the door, weren't they? Yeah. And yeah. That, that's, but I mean, we're going back to like, you know, the kind of early 80s. That was about as luxurious. When, we, when, when sub-basses came out for cars, it was like, whoa, and then... Actually, when you installed them, it generally meant that something went wrong on your the entire electrical system on your <laughs> beat, beaten up old <laughs> crap heap. <laughs> it was like, oh, now I've got no indicators, and it won't pass an MOT. <laughs> so yeah, but hey, I've got a sub base. Even though the sub base was rank, so I think I just kind of eventually just sort of gave up on all that stuff. It's funny though, isn't it? Because uh, that whole listening in the car, checking mixes in the car was always a thing, and specifically. Um, it, because as we've we may have covered this before, but not for certainly a number of years, is there was you, sound systems in American cars specifically seem to have a lot more. They're a lot more geared to actually being able to hear what's going on while driving. 
So, you know, you'd uh, American cars, uh, and it sort of transitioned into a lot of cars here. So you could check your mix in a car, and it would have, you know, obviously extended bass response or whatever, but you could hear a lot more that was going on than perhaps in your studio. I and mean, I don't know. Do you, Mark, I'm sorry, Rich, do you still get the same check the mix in the car kind of culture in the States? Oh, we've lost you. Take a drink, everybody. (laughs) My fault. Sorry. Um, I can't recall the last time I actually had to burn a CD to go out to the car to listen to it. I literally can't recall it. Um, I go back to, like, 1978 and 79 in the pro hi-fi business with the whole car stereo person thing, and I was never a big fan of ridiculous boombox-type car stereos where you could hear... 60 cycles coming down the street about 10 seconds before you started to hear any mid-range. Um, uh, the best I ever heard was a Nakamichi speaker system where they put the, the act. there was a two-way system and the tweeters went higher up on the doors and the six-inch, what Dave referred to as tweeters, uh, were, full, were further down near the floor. And sometimes they were also sub, supplemented with a subwoofer. Alpine did some things like this as well. And some of those sounded pretty good, but car audio is a very brute force sort of thing because you're kind of ignoring anything related to phase response or anything, and you're just kind of brute forcing your audio into this tiny little cubic space and trying to drown out the other noises that are going by and that are otherwise masking some of what you're People listening. honking their horns so, saying, yeah, <laughs> watch out, you're going to hit something. <laughs> right. Well, I was never the guy who, you know, you could hear him coming, you know, that far <laughs> away, but I did have some of those crappy speakers that Dave referred to, uh, Jensen coaxial, you know, oval speakers and shit like that. And, you know, it, it, um, uh, it's better than the AM radio. It can't came in the yeah. car, but, uh, it is what... It can get good. I mean, but it's all brute force. Like I said, really brute force. Yeah. Um, uh, t- uh, somebody called Term Ulus in the YouTube uh, chat room says nothing. It, it basically says, everybody, look at me. I bought a thing. <laughs> and it kind of is. You know? <laughs> and it's always some sort of dubious choice of music as well. It's, it, it's, I guess it's like a bad. I mean, it makes sense. But it's an interesting concept, isn't it? Sorry, Mark, you wanted to come in. They, they pop wins real with shields out as well, don't they, sometimes, these things? So I've got a little story. I don't know if it's appropriate. It's probably really inappropriate, so I'll tell it anyway. (laughs) Um, I was on uh, Hampstead Heath, and we used to go to Hampstead Heath after we'd been to uh, acid house clubs like Trip and Shoom and all those kind of things. And I'd walk down. uh, So so actually, I need to go back a bit before then. I decided when I got into acid house that I would take the speakers out my guitar app and bolt them to the back seat of the car. So anybody who was sitting in my car as a passenger used to get this massive kind of low end ending under 4K kind of bass response, but also like really gnarly middly. But it made 303 sound really good. And I went to Hampstead Heath after a club and I decided that this huge piece of wood uh, that I found on the ground, a branch that had come off a tree probably, was I, I told my friend that we that it was a reincarnated dog and we'd got to save it. So I took this big stick and I put it in the boot of my car, closed the boot of my car, forgot all about it. The next day we'd kind of like chilled out a bit and I'd gone off down to Camden to get something and I was listening to this acid house music really loud in the car and there's this one thing, you know, that everyone used to use that Quija sound that kind of goes. Ooh, 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 ooh. Yeah. I got the whole thing cranked as loud as I could. All the windows wound down and the car's going, I see it! <laughs> <laughs> And then this ooh, 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 comes on. And this person goes to me, oh my God, mate, it sounds like you've got a dog stuck in the boot of that car. And I went, oh yeah, I have. God, I've forgotten all about that. Stop in the middle of the road, open the boot up, get this stick out, put it carefully by this sort of thing at the side of the road, got back in the car and drove off. So there you go. Excellent. I would just like that's to nice uh, point thing. out that that means you got wood at Hampstead Heath. Uh, just just saying. That's all. But anyway. It wasn't that part of the Heath. Oh, it wasn't. It was like <laughs> okay. And it maybe was before that sort of stuff started happening up there as well. Ah. That, yeah, that was definitely a different part. I've been to that part of the Heath. I went there... 
on a, a vision quest uh, that this guy was running, and you had to go and sort of um, you'd go and uh, find your kind of your problem in the in the world and get bits of moss and make this magic circle and everything. Um, and that was kind of scary because as I was making my magic circle, some guy came <laughs> over to visit me because he thought I was there for other reasons, you know, and uh, kind of came, walked into my magic circle and was like, oh, my God, what's going on here? Ah. I was looking at him and thinking, why are you wearing cycling trousers with ripped knees, actually? But <laughs> anyway, we've really gone off topic. We have. Sorry we should probably that. move on. But but anyway, um, that was just a bit of fun. So uh, we'll stop here. And I think it's time for a word from our sponsors. Oh, that's not the right button. This is the right button, however. This is Isotope's vocal synth, multi-engine vocal processing, vocoder, talk box, computer voice, all sorts of facilities. New plugin just out. Great for harmonising. This is the Polyvox module. That is actually uh, the Isotope Fairy singing as well. Vocoder module as well more sort of compu box which i guess is you know craft working and a talk box as well all of those things should you want them and uh, so far actually the the feedback that we've had from people who've won it have said it actually really rocks actually and they're really enjoying it a lot so anyway think outside the box isotope.com forward slash vocal synth uh, we want to say uh, thank you to them as sponsors and also we've got a competition last week we asked you to tweet the hashtag super voice and vocal synth to uh at Sonic State and at Isotope Inc. And uh, we have a winner. The winner is somebody called Transport282. That's at Transport282. Uh, and they tweeted, would love to try a super voice vocal synth for my synth wave tunes. Keep the 80s vibe alive to at Sonic State and at, at Isotope Inc. So the winner is from last week at Transport282. And if you want to uh, get access to the competition this week you need to tweet uh, what we're asking you to tweet is to tweet the hashtag total vocoder and the hashtag vocal synth that's the hashtag total vocoder one word and the hashtag vocal synth one word to at sonic state and at isotope inc once again we thank uh, isotope for sponsoring the show thank you very much so let's see what's the next thing well it's got to be really glastonbury hasn't it um let's see what's happening because there is actually a uh a webcam. Let's let's see. This is the Glastonbury. Oh dear, that's looking very overcast. Obviously, Glastonbury is on this weekend, and in the true, the true tradition of, I th- I was trying to figure this out, and I think it's probably one in three or two in three Glastonburys it rains. Uh, I don't know if it's raining yeah. at the moment, but it looks very much like it is. This is a brilliant webcam actually because you can zoom in, you can show the hot spots, and it says right that's Glastonbury tour. There's the John Peel stage, and it's still going, and it. So it's it, and it's just constantly panning. And oh, what's this one? That's the Silver Haze Festival dance. And there's a, I mean, it's a, honestly, it's a crazy amount of uh, talent and art art going on there. I mean, it seems to be getting so massive that now you know they're saying basically don't come in your car yet because we, because there's there's been a lot of mud. They're saying don't arrive because we're not ready for you because it's taking so people so long to get on the site. And it just seems <laughs> it seems like it's going to be a bit of a nightmare, really. I, I know, Mark, you're in Glastonbury. Presume do you get a lot of people abandoning their cars and walking the rest of the way? I mean, it's still a few miles to, from where you are to where it is, right? Well, the thing is, yeah, I live in Glastonbury. And I live on the A361, which is the main route into Glastonbury off the M5 and the main route to Pilton from the M5. And my front door has got stationary traffic sitting outside it. And it's been, the, you know, I looked out this morning about 20 minutes later, the same car was still out there and hadn't moved. And people are just getting out and having a street party. But I'm at least five, six miles away from the site. So they've got a long way to go from where I am. Um, so I hope they don't abandon their cars outside my house. But we've just given up. We just thought, you know what, let's just not use the car this week because it's no point in trying to go anywhere. I don't think. Um, Is yeah, there any? Are, crazy, are you, you going? Are you going? Do you? You're not close enough to get the free ticket and be able to sort of wander in, are you? Or are you going? Have you got access? No, you have to live in Pilton. Ah, that's right. If which is the, the village? T- they only give free tickets to people that live in Pilton. Uh, I could. I could have bought. Uh, uh, a Glastonbury resident ticket, which is cheaper, or I could have bought a Sunday afternoon ticket, but I 
uh, got a bit muddled up about the date that it was gonna. They were selling the tickets, and they sold them earlier this year. So no, I didn't get a ticket. Um, I do know loads of different people who are going. I'm sure if I wanted to go, I could. But I just it it looks a bit messy this year, actually. Yeah, I think it last. Might... I mean, last year didn't I go down? I went down there on my motorbike last year, and I rode from my house all the way down to the site and there was just no stationary traffic. They managed it brilliantly last year. This year they had all that rain last week. I mean, it was absolutely sheets of rain coming down here. So um, I think that's what's messed it up, the rain. Um, uh, Dave, I, I, I saw that the Underworld are playing, um, which is one of the... And I think, are they going to be using some of the new modular kit uh, for this live show, do you know? Yeah, Rick takes... Uh... Rick takes a, a bit of it out, a bit, compared to the big bit that just keeps growing and growing and growing. Uh, yeah, so, yes, uh, this, yeah, I'm not going. I'm not going. I was asked to go down last year uh, to Kanye West, actually. I think he asked me if I'd pop down and teach him how to become a civil human being. Um, <laughs> But then I thought, I don't think I can do that. No, that's all complete lies. I haven't been for years, and it's something I would probably avoid now. I don't know. I have no real... It's a bit weird, isn't it? Because the B footage is so good that actually sometimes... I was very tempted to go down when Stevie Wonder did that thing. In fact, it even had a knock-on effect because thanks to some very kind people who watch and listen to Sonic Talk, remember I was talking about getting the Stevie tickets at Hyde Park for this Songs in the Key of Life an issue in fatwas to people who were going to be ahead of me in the telephone queue. Uh, a couple of people call, uh, emailed me and said, oh, you know, actually there's some advanced tickets going on today. Uh, this was back then. So I did, and I bought them. And so, yeah, I'm there. I'm kind of there. I'm in the scumbag seats, you know, just the normal punter seats, which is going to be quite interesting, and not in this VIP circle, which I assume will be just full of rich people. I think that's why I don't really enjoy those kind of enormous dome gigs anymore, because it's like money no money a bit more money over there it's become it's like getting on a plane isn't it if you don't turn left um anyway i'm booked and i'm going and then all of a sudden i see that the beeb are gonna televise it and i'm like actually you know (laughs) 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 because i've booked two hotel you know uh, two nights in a hotel so we can walk through Hyde Park and I've thought, I'm gonna you know, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity for me and I've waited forever, so let's make a deal out of it. And then I was kinda like, I know what's gonna happen. We're probably just gonna get drunk in the bar and watch it on T V in the hotel. No, you won't. I can't imagine you do Well, you, you can't do things like taking drink to the I mean it's an all day, isn't it? Pharrell's there and some a few other people are there. And you can't take drink, you can't take your own drink in, you can't take an umbrella in. In the UK, you can't take an umbrella into a festival what? gig. Wow. You, you can't take a chair in. This is the Hyde Park gig. I mean, obviously, security is going to be completely mental. I was just like, yeah, maybe I should just... Anyway, I won't. I won't. You will but it go. it may come to that. I may go and then go, you know what, let's go back to the hotel. Cause if they've got decent margaritas. Well, that's worth that, That's worth knowing. If they have, uh, Rich. I mean, you played Glastonbury. She. Um, it was. It wasn't last year, was it? Was it the year before? Oh, he's gone again. <coughs> <coughs> Take another right. drink. He's got jet lag. I believe we played in twenty thirteen. Oh gosh, year. is it that long ago? Right. Okay. And, Great. And what was the weather like for that? I can't recall now. Was it? It was a rainy year, I think, wasn't it? Well, it wasn't raining when we played, ah, well, and that's all I was there for, so I don't know. So, I mean, in terms of the logistics of something like that, I mean, I know we probably talked to you about it before, but I'm, I'm interested in exploring the whole thing. So, you know, I guess the crew set up all of the, the kit, you show up, do you get a line check? I mean, is it really, or is it really, you're on, the line check is the first, the intro to the first number, and then, you know, then it's all systems the, the go. Line, the line check is performed generally by the crew. You know, just making sure you've got levels and signal from every place you need it. And they are generally starting on consoles that they have programs written for that have our setups in them. So it's not as hit or miss, you know, it's not like sitting in front of a, you know, 48-channel analog console and trying to mix this thing from the ground up. 
they're starting from a place that's worked before. And that's true of a lot of our shows, because festival gigs quite often don't allow you to get a proper sound check at all. It's line check to make sure you've got signal down all the wires, and then uh, you're starting from a place that you ended up at some other show. Uh, it gets mixed from there. Right. So, I mean, the other thing is, obviously, now with uh, with Glastonbury, I mean, BBC stream it, so there must be an OB truck where the, another mix is taking place that has to be also kind of properly manned. I mean, Dave, have you experienced that situation where, you know, there, there's obviously the front of house who does front of house, and then there's got to be somebody who know, also knows what they're doing in the truck to make sure that it goes out? Because when it, it's going live, you know, obviously there's maybe a two-minute delay, but you don't get many chances you know, when that sort of thing's happening. I mean, how does... And that's a lot of pressure to put on, you know, two engineers, basically. I mean, I'm sure there are more people around, but have you seen that in operation? Not for a long time. I did talk to Will Gregory about it, because don't forget, he, he actually did that, didn't he, on one particular tour. He, was, he wasn't playing, but he would be out in the OB. I got a feeling that might have been Glastonbury, actually. He was there making sure the Beeb got the mix right. On the world, it's slightly different, because... You know, Rick, I mean, that SSL desk that Rick's got is just amazing. So it's, uh, you so know, they, have, they have that on stage with them to sort of for full recall, right? Yeah, I mean, that's that's his instrument, really. Uh, so he's, and obviously he's throwing things out to front of house guy, uh, but it's not as complex as what Rick's dealing with on stage. So they're, they're, they're kind of slightly different kettle of fish, which is why I was intrigued talking to Will. Uh, because I, I, I probably shouldn't say this, but there was a the Bristol, the beat Bristol thing. There was some. Actually, I thought it sounded amazing, but there were a couple of people within the camp had kind of said, "Oh, uh, the ones." Actually, I think that might have been visual. I should probably just shut up because I'll probably get either myself yes. or somebody else into trouble. Okay. Uh, fair enough. But, I mean, what's interesting about that is obviously this. Uh, the, the, uh, fortunately, the way. Uh, do you think it's partly because console technology with recall or whatever has happened at the same time that we've got a lot of OB and a lot of stuff that's been televised? You, has one enabled the other, or one has followed the other? Because I mean, if you were doing this without this kind of recall and be able to kind of bring everything together so quickly, I mean, a lot of acts Dude, would, I not, was, would not I, agree to being presumably. I was. I was touring back in the days before all of these consoles. I mean, that was, you know, I don't think I've done it really properly. And that was great, especially on the kind of festival shed circuit. It was crazy stuff. And sometimes the front of house guys having to repatch an entire desk, you know, 48 channel desk, get the tie lines in between there and the stage because, you know, something hasn't happened before the gig. It's, I mean, I've seen some... I used to really quite like those moments because they're the ones that separate the wheat from the chaff. And you have a very finite period of time to do your line check, get the band, you know, make sure the band's happy and stuff and get on that stage and do that gig. Some bands, and you could generally tell the ones who didn't really care, you know, they were just looking at the kind of, well, they were basically looking at the rider and the earn out. <laughs> Whereas... I love that kind of, for me, that was the adrenaline buzz, the kind of little moments of panic to do a live a festival thing. And then you're out, and then you're gone. You know, you do the thing, you're out, you've got maybe 20 minutes in the dressing room to get changed, and you're on a bus or you're on a plane, and you're to bloody Ross Kilder or wherever. I like that. That was a good scene. But that's all become a lot easier with, you know, recall with digi desks and stuff. Yeah, I know. I suppose so. I, I, I know, Mark. I mean, I guess you know. We all know that you did, what, that you mixed uh, your brother at uh, at Glastonbury, and I mean, I've mixed a couple of things on the world stage and what have you. But it is that, mo and, and that, but that was back in analog days when you know I was working with a, I think it was a ten piece funk band. You know, so it was brass percussion, the whole works, and it, it's really, it really sharpens you up. <laughs> I have yeah. to say, it definitely does. <laughs> we did loads of festivals with Duran as well, and it was literally. Everything's on um, on risers, and you have all of your tie lines on your riser, and you wheel the riser into place and plug all the XLRs in. And literally, all you've got to find out is whether you plug the right thing in the same the right place. That's your line check. It's just making sure that what what the monitor guy and the front of house guy think is coming up on each channel 
is the thing that's going to come up on that channel for them, and that's all. That's kind of all the prep they do, really, for those kind of things. Um, and it can go very wrong, actually. Yeah, no, it certainly can. I know, Rich. That's especially an inter- with the advent of in ears. Actually, now since people. When people started using in ears, it all started getting much more difficult because they can't hear what you're doing. I suppose, yeah. You've got to I, set yeah. up a mix for each person, yeah. Well, that's a good point, uh, Rich. There's an interesting thing came in the chat room, which was, uh, you know, obviously you're doing more festivals, certainly from a performer point of view, than perhaps uh, any of us. I mean, what what are people? Because it used to be, you know, that obviously we know that so, some acts have playback. There is live playback, and I know she can't one of those one of those acts, but. What are you seeing? What are people using these days for, for that sort of technology? Because there's more black box kind of stuff now rather than a, 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 an actual computer rig, which is kind of a terrifying thing to take into that sort of environment. Are you seeing any specific hardware for playback for certain tracks? Because obviously you've got certain BV sections and things that you know are impossible to, to, to spin in. I'm not generally privy to exactly what other people are using. I can tell you what we've used in the past. When we have we, as Sheik, we never play with backing track, period. Uh, everything you hear comes from the stage. When we did the iTunes Festival in 2013, there were 51 bands on the festival. Wow. Three of them played the stage entirely. Three out of 51. 48 wow. of them played to some degree of backing, recorded backing. Um when we play with guest artists at these festivals where we're accompanying others, quite often they come in with backing tracks. And so, for example, at the Fold Festival uh, this weekend, we'll be using this, <laughs> which is a Motu uh, Hybrid Mark III, Ultra, um, which is a really, really fantastic device. And has, I think, something like, I don't know, 14 outputs. It's got some different outputs. But, uh, and, you know, does 192K, weighs next to nothing, and costs 500 bucks. Um, and we do uh, usually use computers. And because this isn't a regular part of our lives, we don't have redundant systems running side by side. I do know that of the people I've worked with who do play to backing tracks, they typically have redundant systems in a switch. So that when or if the feces hits the fan on one of those systems, you can you have them both running simultaneously. You just hit the switch and you hit the switch. It's a bunch of yeah. relays and it switches over the, the, the lines and everything, yeah. Which is over the whole feed. Um, and I think if you're going to use computers, that's really the only way to go. Um, the, I, I'm not, like I say, I'm not generally like spooking the backstage area looking to see what everybody's using. Hmm. I, so I, I don't really know. One of the things that we've seen recently is uh, there's obviously the Joko Black Box, which you can rack up and sync up. And that, I did a really interesting interview with, well, I thought it was interesting, with uh, a guy from Cymatica Audio. And they do a 24-channel playback and record system, uh, which you can just sync multiple ones. It's a really clever system, and it uses, uh, uh, I forget the protocol, it's AES50-something uh, protocol. And you could just have mult, mults going on with that, and then they can switch over very easily. And that's something that's kind of... I, I'd imagine is quite useful to people who need, you know, the audience expect the record. So, you know, which is, 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 is more or less the case. I mean, you get a bit of both now. I mean, it's not just about the, uh, the exact experience, but in some cases that, that's still the feel that I guess the acts and the, and the promoters feel that they need to get that. So it'd be interesting to see if uh, there's much of that going on at Glassby. I mean, I think Glassby do try and focus more on much more live performance, but as we say, it's on, uh, I think, Bands probably start. Is it Friday or Thursday that they start? Does anyone know? And uh, Friday, and it'll, it'll be on the BBC, which you probably won't be able to get if you're outside the UK. But it's well worth checking out because their coverage is amazing. I mean, it's it it seems to get all the great angles, and the camera work is so good that it really takes you inside the performance and also includes the audience, so you get a v- buzz of what it's like. I mean, I remember watching the Sheet gig, and it was just so much like. I am so getting this. It's it. It really yeah. looks like you had a blinder of a gig, and as we spoke about at the time, it really did make a really big difference to the perception of Niall and Sheik and the whole band and everything. Just sort of, I guess, blew up a bit even bigger from that, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, they did a fantastic job with production, and um, watching it back, I was really impressed with the director's calls, the camera angles, 
the, the way the audience was included, just like you just described. It was really, really well done. Obviously, these people have vast experience in doing it and know exactly how to, to respond. Because it's, it is, you know, there's a jazz element. There's, there, you can't plan everything. Things happen you don't expect. And all of the people involved in this are acting spontaneously based on what's before them right now, much as you are when you're playing music with people. Yeah. So um, I was really impressed with the uh, production quality both there and at the iTunes Festival, which we played both that year in 2013. And uh, the, the sound, the video, everything really... Uh, you can go back, anybody who's curious, can go back to YouTube and dig up Sheik at Glastonbury and you can see what we're talking about. But they really do a great job. Yeah, excellent. Well, it's well worth watching. Uh, I wanted to get this topic in because uh, this is also probably perhaps a bit more interesting um, to, 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 to you, D uh, Dave, just because there's news that the, uh, the Curtis chips are back in production, at least one of them, the uh, three, what is it, the three, three... Gosh, what's it called? The three three four or the three three four O is back in production. Which yeah, uh, anybody knows? I mean, uh, certainly a lot of Dave Smith instruments, a, a dope for stuff. A lot of things use the Curtis chip line, which are kind of essentially either elements of a synth voice or a complete voice or VCAs or VCFs. Or generally, in, in this case, they're reproducing the oscillators. In fact, I've got a, a handy list here, which I don't know if you'll be able to see, but. Uh, there are a whole list of 3340 is, let me see, 3340 is the VCO, which is the Trisaw Pulse. But in fact, uh, the 3394 was a complete synth voice as well. I mean, it, uh, uh, on, I, I'm trying to remember the name of the company. I think it's Onchip. Um, who are the manufacturers who I believe were uh, had something to do with Mary Curtis, uh, who I think was it was a whole hell of the family. This is actually quite big news, and the possibility they might produce some more. I mean, is that it, it's surprising that there are less kind of integrated instrument type chips? I mean, I know it's very niche, and you have to make lots and lots of them, but these are going to be fifteen bucks each. Each these three three four O's, and they go for a hundred bucks online. So this is it's almost like the vintage, the, the the reissues that we're seeing from Moog and from Korg and all that. This is a kind of a, 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 an evolution of that, right? Yeah, and I would encourage anybody who's got anything with Curtis chips, particularly these are the six O's, aren't they? Uh, throw four O's. Sorry, the like six O's are the VCFs, which we're really hoping that they're going to make uh, remake next uh, for the money. I mean, I ha I ha we haven't paid. We've got an awful lot of stuff with Curtis stuff in it. Things like. Uh, the OB-8 uses this chip. Uh, Jupiter-6 uses this chip. Uh, there's loads. There's a lot. Uh, so you kind of get to this point where you're like, actually, in order to protect the instruments that we've got, we now need to start looking for various Curtis chips to have as spares. And I think what's happened is, is that various people have stockpiled them and over the years, and then that sends the price high. There have even been fake ones issued on eBay you know, like copies that people have bought and gone, well, that was junk. So you're always trying to buy from a reliable source, and it's a bit like drug dealing, isn't it? It's kind of weird. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, have, you got, have you got any Curtis, mate? Have you got any Curtis? No, but I've got some SSMs. Oh, even better. <laughs> um, yeah, so yes, yes, please, please, buy, support. Yes, because we, we really want... I'd love to see the SSM stuff done, the 2040s. And the 2044s. Let me see. I'm just the really beautiful filter, filter chips. They really are. 20 so it would be great. They're the SSMs. Oh, yeah. Uh, these are uh, four section VCF uh, or uh, the 2038 voltage control oscillator as well. So, uh, But they, these are all sort of chips. Some of them are complete voice chips as well, which I think the dark energy, don't for dark energy, used as well. Yeah, when you look at things like, it's, it's very interesting looking at, well, for me, it's very interesting for everybody else. It's probably dull as anything, but things like, you know, when you look at the first generation uh, profit, say the Rev 2 and the Rev 3, you're looking at a 2030 VCO, that's as an SSM and a 2040 VCF. In the Simmons SDS-5, it's one of the reasons why that's such a beautiful piece of kit. You've got an SSM 2044, I think, in that. And then what happens is, is in the Rev 3 Profit 5s, you got, they moved over to the Curtis chips, the CEM, so that'll be the um, 3340. Uh, and then uh, what have they got? Fil the filters is the 3320. 
uh, we're, like I say, we're really hoping that they're going to go for those 3320s. If they start making those, that'll be really, really good. Um, Profit 5, the Rev 3, that's the same. So that'll all be Curtis chips. And then you start getting more integrated chips when you start moving to things like uh, Profit 600. Right, so the Profit yeah. 600. 3340 VCO, but it'll be a combined VCF and VCA chip. So it's just as technology kind of marches on, they get they manage to squeeze a little bit more on a chip. But what you can end up with are instruments that, for example, you think, Oh, yeah, great, I've got this real bargain instrument here, which is going to be worth a fortune in years to come if that's your bent. And then all of a sudden, you find that there's a chip in there that is on its way out and you cannot get that chip for love nor money and that's a real issue that that is becoming an issue with very 80s stuff right I, like i say i think it's curious that nobody's really built and i mean because i guess a lot of what's happening now people are designing their own discrete circuits and what have you i mean uh, uh, and so that makes a big difference i know mark i mean i'm guessing you know being uh working with um, nick rhodes i mean curtis and sems are kind of you know a mainstay of a lot of the stuff that he's been using with synthesizers over the years yeah there's been lots of things um I, I want them to remake the one that's in the mirage the vcf that's in the insonic mirage because that takes digital wavetables and makes them sound smooth and nice so whatever that was that's a curtis chip i think and the sq80 i don't know if it's the same one but it's a it's very that, similar i think that um that marriage of uh, 8-bit digital and warm vintage analog sounds particularly beautiful, and I, I, uh, I want to explore like maybe making some kind of synth that does that now, if you know what I mean. Um, so if they remake those Curtis chips, then I, I I'll start making circuits that have got them in. Oh well, yeah, no, I suppose. I mean, at the moment, I'm trying to make things with resistors and capacitors. But if somebody had done it all for me, I'd be very pleased. You know? <laughs> well, isn't I mean, isn't there a danger that you end up with a sort of generic sound? Uh, and that's the thing. I, I see you nodding there, Rich. I mean, there's. I mean, that that is got to be a danger, surely. If everybody, I like that sound, though. Well, yeah, maybe. Well, I, it's funny you raised it, Mark, because I was going to mention in Sonic because I was at their factory back in the day and we used to be in door season there, as I believe you guys were as well. Yeah. And um, they used to manufacture chips um, for their instruments and or at least create them on the premises. I don't know if they did large scale. I mean, for the lighter ones but, they did, yeah. Well, certainly by the time I got, I mean, by the time of even e, EPS, I think, even by that time they were doing it but in any case that's a good example of a company whose parts are just absolutely non-existent and the only way to repair some of their gear is to find another working one that you're willing to basically raid for parts yeah because you're not going to get that part period there's nobody making them now if somebody comes around and decides that they're so romantic about an old eps 16 plus that they don't want to go ahead and make the chip required to get that lovely 13-bit sample sound which they had um then then maybe that'll change but for the moment um if you have an product and i do have a few and it fails uh, like for example if you needed a display something as simple as a display for instance you would have to find another version of that synthesizer sitting in somebody's junkyard and rip the display out of it because they're just they don't exist and there's nobody manufacturing them and the the price of manufacturing you know half a dozen uh, yeah, of these. yeah yeah absolutely uh, interestingly yeah. in the chat room uh asio head i believe is it asio head or uh scott no scott from canada says uh that uh the uh the new the profit six has some of the new curtis chips in it apparently uh uh, I think that Dave got some in advance for that project, which must mean that that's... But it does beg the question, I mean, you know, I, as we know, because I, I think uh, the Behringer Corporation has been buying up some of the sort of smaller chip manufacturers and patents, and it would make sense to make more of these things, because, I mean, there's only... If there's only one manufacturer in all of this entire industry, or a lot of the classics amongst it, I mean, obviously, not talking about the big, discrete analogue uh, stuff, use, this, use these kind of things, then surely somebody's got to make... 
would make sense for somebody to make another range of them. I mean, considering that some of the chips that are made and for the niche products, I mean, there must be stuff. At, there must be it must be worthwhile. You guess? I don't know. Maybe it's not. Yes, please, please do it, please, please, or something new even. How about that? No. Well, <laughs> yeah, something new as well. As, as well. well as. But yeah. no, I mean, things like the 2040s and the 2044s, the SSM stuff, you know, if somebody remade those, I'm sure there'd be a huge waiting list. Huge. You know, that's things like in your Poly 6. Oh, actually, your Monopoly will be something like a 2040. Yeah. And they're just a really kind of un, they're slightly unwieldy, very powerful. In fact, we've got a Rev 3 Profit 5 and a Rev 3 Profit 10, and we have a Rev 2 Profit 5, which, is got, which has obviously got the SSMs in. That's been fixed at the minute, but that's, this is how sad I am. This is going to be one of the highlights of my year, putting the two Rev, the Rev 2 and the Rev 3 side by side. And A being them. I know people are just... Right. Shoot video. Yeah, wow. <laughs> Shoot video, but please, it, Dave. Love your video. It's the, it's the filter. Uh, the, uh, actually, and in some cases, and this is what I got kind of a little bit... So we kind of went off on this Curtis Chip exploration thing for, for a while. Um, but things like their envelopes aren't... They really aren't the... You know, the, they're not super super snappy and then all of a sudden you compare that with an ssm and it's like whoa this is like borderline just kind of particularly with filters you can kind of take it to an edge and you think it's never going to come back it's never going to come back and it will but the curtis stuff is is definitely more tame so it's it's the sound it's a very 80s type sound really i think yeah, well, maybe that's maybe Look, that's. Part see, of it. even Nick's fallen asleep. No, I'm. I just remembered I was going to say something about uh, uh, some chords. I got I got some patch chords from um, Folds Music. They sent they sent me a selection of uh, patch chords, which are these uh, lots of nice coloured. Uh, this is sort of modular stuff. Foldsmusic.co.uk because you mentioned the Folds Festival there, Rich. Uh, not not related. F O U L D S dot co dot uk, and you get like a big handful of these for. I think they're. 20 quid or a tenner it's, it seems like a very uh, reasonable price I haven't checked them out yet but I'm guessing they work no, I, I like the colour coding um, it feels like we're probably heading towards that time sorry I just realised I was on me while you were talking there that wasn't uh, that was a, a, a operator error uh, well, another thing oh. I wanted to mention I've just got this in for review I don't know if you've seen these are this is a uh, it's called a Sipario by lab for music and it's basically a, a dedicated MIDI patch bay and router so the idea is you've got a uh, USB host mode, you've got two ins and two outs, and on the front you can just basically up to eight zones. So you could plug a dummy keyboard in, create multiple zones, output them on MIDI channels, and also send clocks and patch changes across them. And it's just a, it's got a touch screen, so it's a simple matter of just programming it up and then hitting the button or oh. pressing this button to to step through oh no that's not well, it exit and i just saw i saw it at, at, at music messer and i just thought that is a really cool idea so you could just advance through with this green button so you could use it as your master controller so you know like programmable midi controller effectively if you've got like a maybe nice piano or in my case which i wanted to try and use it for the live set so i've just rather than at the moment i've got an ipad and an eye connectivity i just think i just go bang and it just goes yep all the patches going out to everything and there's a you know there's a the only thing it won't have obviously is a picture of the patch on my modular setup but uh, i'm going to hopefully going to be reviewing that sort sometime soon gosh we seem well, to have i know I know people who've been lamenting the demise of Opcode's Studio 5 for whatever decade and a half it's been since they killed the thing because it did some of these kinds of things very, very effectively for people who are running live shows based on large MIDI rigs. So the fact that this thing appears in 2016, I think, will be very interesting to any of those people who are still running those large MIDI rigs in the world. Well, yeah, situations. I, 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 I don't think there are as many. I'm looking, I, I mean, th my immediate reaction was this is a great one, but it would be b better if you had even more MIDI ports on it as well. I guess you could have a MIDI splitter because you can s channelize everything and just have two separate MIDI buses plus a, a USB MIDI bus because it works in a host mode. So I, I'm wondering if I might be able to, with the host mode there, I might be able to uh, plug this into my uh, Artoria Beatstep Pro and have that powered and get all its stuff 
you know that it needs from that and that would be much simpler uh, i must admit although once again i don't it means i don't have pictures of my uh modular patches on the on the screens it's too small anyway i should probably uh probably stop now and uh want to say if you are at Glastonbury I mean no Gaz is playing at Glastonbury I think he said last count was 7 gigs I uh, hope the weather isn't too bad because it's 7 uh, gigs 7 gigs yeah it's a bloody it is one 7 of, different bands uh, yes more or less so there's a couple but he's also uh, I think one of them uh, as he mentioned last week is a nude gig in a particular area of the site where it's uh, naked only and the band have to be naked too so I really want to hear <laughs> how that goes because that just sounds like such fun but if you're not um, I don't think that will be televised on the BBC perhaps but uh, <laughs> if, you, if you've not got the opportunity check that out uh, if you're going to Glastonbury or uh, you know people are going uh, be safe and stay dry and all of those things and drink lots of water and um, try and you know stay stay whatever enjoy yourselves amongst other things so that's it for this week thank you yeah, very much come to my shop and come into your to shop, shop on the way back that's a good idea Glastonbury post Glastonbury I'm sure people will want to buy guitars and stuff to carry home with their tents absolutely yeah that I think they should maybe, you maybe should I should uh, I could ship mud out to people as well who are watching it on TV if anyone wants a bucket of mud I can do it nice oh that's a good mud. idea R- real Glastonbury mud anyway Mark yeah, thank you very much for joining us and thank you for showing us around your shop you're very welcome, and thank you for having me. Yeah, and, uh, thank you, and I hope it uh, continues to go well. And also, I want to say thank you very much to Rich Hilton for joining us. I'm sure. Have you got a bit of downtime now, or have you got to go and do your gig tonight? I've got the night off. Ah. And, and tomorrow, uh, when I say that I've got the gig the night off, I've actually got a bit of preparation to do for tomorrow's rehearsal. Tomorrow's rehearsal and sound check, and then Friday begins uh, three days of festival performances okay well have a great series of shows rich uh, i don't think i'm gonna be able to hook up with you this time which is uh, much to my shame but another time i hope i look forward to it i you know i'm here every year so we'll figure it out and also thank uh, you for having me you're in. you are more than welcome thanks for persevering with your internet connection we never found out we never found out what the hotel was oh rich. yeah what was the hotel is, is it a chain you don't have to mention the hotel but the chain i don't care uh, it's it's a double tree in Chelsea. It's um, part of the Hilton chain, actually. Ah, ah, oh, Mr. Hilton, we've been expecting <laughs> really <well>. you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, did you get that? Did you get the room upgrade that you you try and wangle every time you stay in a Hilton based? Up? <laughs> I don't wangle the upgrade, but everybody always notices when you check in and your name is Hilton. Okay. Well, I hope they treat you with the uh, the respect that your name deserves. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm, I have no worries about it. Anyway, and thank you very much, Rich. And also, thank you, Dave Spears, uh, g4software.com. Thanks for joining us as well. Thank you. I survived. I need a lay down now. Yeah, and I've just just to say, uh, we were at Kimmery Beats on uh, the weekend, and we've got performances uh, which we filmed and we did stream, which I think it held up reasonably well. We've got VCO ADSR, uh, Eden Gray, uh, Thypo Sandra, Mute Groups, and uh, John Biddulph. So uh, do stay tuned, uh, and they will be coming out. We also got interviews with most of those, so there's a bit of context to what you're seeing as well. That's it for this week. Thank you very much for watching. Don't forget, if you like what you see and you want to see more, we've got reviews and interviews and all things coming up. Uh, please do subscribe to the channel. See you next time. <laughs>